the rest of that night, I'm, I'm hearing more and more stories about bullying and ostracization and how, how young people who stutter are made to feel alone, like they're the only person on earth who has this challenge. And I, I realized leaving that night, I could either say, wow, that is really, really difficult to, to hear. I'm so glad Say is doing the work that they're doing. Maybe I'll come back next year, maybe I'll donate. Or you can put a camera on your shoulder and go out and start filming and try to amplify what you see. Welcome to Some Stutter Law, Newfoundland Labrador's first podcast about stuttering. My name is Greg O'Grady, and I'm a co-host of Some Stutter Law, Newfoundland and Labrador's first podcast about stuttering, along with my co-host. And I'm Caitlin Mayo. I'm a student and an aspiring speech-language pathologist, and I'm Greg's co-host on this podcast. Some Stutter Law mission is dismantling and rebuilding stuttering. Let's start listening. Some Stutter Law mandate is, in the spirit of Newfoundland and Labrador humor, robust and frank interactive discussions. Some Stutter Law podcast aims to rebuild competence and hope for today's and tomorrow's person who happened to stutter by dismantling stuttering myths, stigma, stereotypes, and barriers. The objectives of Some Stutter Law podcast are supporting, raising awareness, and increasing understanding and acceptance of stuttering providing people who stutter, their families, professionals, students, and the general public with current information, research, and resources about stuttering, and promoting the NLSA mission of advocacy and support for people who stutter. Today, some, uh, some uh, uh, stutter uh, welcomes Ryan uh, Gillen. And uh, Ryan, you know, Ryan, you know, Ryan is the, uh, uh, Ryan, you know, Ryan is the, the, uh, the, the, the director and producer of my beautiful stutter, and uh, for those you know those of you know for those uh, for those listeners that have not seen my beautiful stutter, it it is an amazing, overwhelming uh, film, and uh, it it really you know the you know, depicts the, the, the harsh realities of people who stutter from 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 uh, youth to to adolescents and and adults now just you know just, just to give you a little little uh, background about Ryan Ryan uh, Ryan's uh, producing credits include the new documentary as i just mentioned my my beautiful stutter from a, a, a executive producers Mariska Hegede Peter Herdman, Paul Root, and George Springer, and 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 the the upcoming documentary, Bombardier Blood, from uh, for, for, you know, from executive producer Alex Borstein, director. Ryan's film ha has have won awards for writing and direction in festivals around the world. And he's two-time Webby winner for the interactive 2010 web series, uh, uh, Deleted the Game. Ryan is a contributor to the nofilmschool.com, Sundance, Sundance Film Festival Artist Services blog, and Tribeca Film Fest blog. Ryan and his brother Matthew are the co-founders of DVDs to the Troops, which as of July 1st, 2020 has collected and shipped an estimated 215,000 used and new DVDs to, you know, to American military personnel in war zones around the world. Thanks a lot, Ryan, for joining us today. So Ryan, you know, you, you know, you know, you, you know, you have a, Quite a history in in, in 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 writing, directing, and producing. Would you, would you like to 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 share to share a little bit about your history? Sure. I uh, I'm not a person who stutters. Um, I am. Uh, I like to think of myself as an ally and an advocate. But before I started on the project, um, I was just uh, an independent filmmaker and co-owner of a content agency here in Los Angeles and, and in New York City. And so we are a group of, of you know, founded by myself and Patrick Lynch, my, my partner here. 
uh, just a group of actors and writers and producers and directors who, you know, independent film is not, you know, a, a tr very stable business. So we built an agency that could provide clients with some really strong writing and producing and directing and video and podcasts and live events and kind of taking all of our strengths and putting it to work for us while we made films uh, that we cared about sort of on the side or on nights and weekends. And um, My Beautiful Stutter has been my sort of nights and weekends project for seven years. And so it was a, a big journey, a big mission, something that I believed in very, very strongly in, in um, you know, shining a light on and, and highlighting, amplifying the voices of young people who stutter. Um, and I'm thrilled that it's it's out in the world now that people can actually see the film. Ryan, you know, how did the, you know, the, the, you know, how did the film My Beautiful Stutter come to, to you know, to reality? What's, you know, what's the, the, the his, history behind it? My producer, Michael Alden, produced The King's Speech on Broadway and on the West End in London, and the, the play version. And he, in 2014, took me to the Say Gala. And he said, you know, he, he liked some of the films I had made. And, and he said, come with me. I want you to see this. I think there might be a film in this. There's a story in here worth telling. And the 2014 Say Gala, you get a hint of it in, in the film, how the gala goes. But basically, you know, it's the, the lower, lower West Side in Manhattan. Um, beautiful, beautiful auditorium on the campus of, of NYU. And the, everybody's 500 people all dressed to the nines. The lights go down in this gorgeous auditorium. There's a single spotlight on stage. And this little eight-year-old boy walks into the spotlight and he's in his beautiful little gray suit, little blue tie. He's got his hair all cut and gelled and you know, looking just adorable. He's clutching a piece of paper. And he walks out into the single spotlight and he says, welcome to the 2014 Say Gala. But it takes him 15, 20 seconds to say it because he's stuttering. And when he's done, you can see him wait and look around He's frozen, he's looking out and, and you realize in that moment, he's waiting to hear laughter. He's waiting to hear snickering. He's waiting to hear people saying mean things because that's what his experience is like on a day-to-day -day basis in school when he speaks or when he's asked to read from the book that they're all reading. And after a few seconds of silence, what ends up happening is a standing ovation. The whole, whole crowd stands, applauds, it washes over him. And you can see in that moment, I could see this kid grow a foot. His whole being changed. His shoulders rolled back. He's, he started emanating light. He, he floated off stage. And I realized later, it's because in that moment, he realized what Say, the Stuttering Association for the Young, he realized that what Taro Alexander and Say had been telling him was true, that he was worthy of being heard, that the way he speaks is beautiful, he's worthy of being listened to. And so that, that's a pretty profound experience to have, you know, as an audience member, leaving, you know, for the rest of that night, I'm, I'm hearing more and more stories about bullying and ostracization and how, how young people who stutter are made to feel alone, like they're the only person on earth who has this challenge. Um, and I, I realized leaving that night, I could either say, wow, that is really, really difficult to, to hear. I'm so glad Say is doing the work that they're doing. Maybe I'll come back next year. Maybe I'll donate. Or you can put a camera on your shoulder and go out and start filming and try to amplify what you see. And I was deeply, deeply moved. And I didn't think I could turn away. I, I, I knew I couldn't turn away. So it took about a year to find a little bit of money to get Say's permission to start filming, to earn their trust. But a year later, we started filming at the Say Gala, a few weeks in advance of the Say Gala. And that was in 2015. And so it's been a six year journey since, since we started filming, a seven year journey since I first went to a Say Gala. But leaving that first gala, I knew that if, that I, I knew that nobody else was telling this story. I knew that Say was fighting the good fight, but there was no media out there fighting the good fight with them. 
And that's been true. That was true then. It's true seven years later. There is no, you know, when when a a business person, you know, goes to a meeting and they sit across from someone who stutters, and they come home at night and they're like, "Honey, it was." They're at the dinner table like, "Honey, it was so interesting that the woman sitting across from me, you know, in our pitch meeting today was a person who stutters." And they talk about what it was like to to meet that person. For a lot of other challenges, for a lot of other interesting um, uh, disfluencies or educational challenges, intellectual um, challenges, there's something you can point to. The person sitting across from you at the dinner table that night when you're telling the story can say, oh, did you see the documentary on Netflix about that, right? Or, oh, did you see the documentary on iTunes about that, on HBO about that, right? Like if it was somebody on the spectrum, there are autism documentaries you can point to. If it's somebody who um, loves to paint with their feet, their documentary, there's literally content about every interesting thing that a person can engage with. But if, but if I bumped into someone who stuttered seven years ago and then went home and told my wife about it, there was nothing we could point to to learn more. There was nothing we could sit and watch to learn more. It just didn't exist. And it doesn't exist to this day other than my beautiful stutter. So knowing that, I said, you know, I can either walk away, I can either turn away, or I can create that thing that I want people to be able to point to, that I, that I want even the kids who are on stage to be able to go watch. You know, I wanna give them a touchstone too. It just didn't exist. Um, and I, so I wanted to create it. I wanted to create it to fight on behalf of young people who stutter. Ryan, you know, how were, were the, uh, the kids chosen? Like, you know, my beautiful stutter, it follows five kids who stutter ages from nine to 18 from all, all, all over the United States and all walks of life. After experiencing a lifetime of uh, bullying and stigmatization, you know, how were they chosen or did they volunteer? How, how were the, the parents involved? That's a great question. So say made introductions, say, first of all, told everybody who was doing their weekend workshops, who was doing their gala, who was going to their camp, that there's a film being made. And if you'd like to opt out, you can. Um, but so everyone who didn't opt out, I, I actually don't know if anybody opted out because basically I had free reign once I had earned Say's trust and they had gotten to know me and my filming style. Um, but after I was able to go in with a camera and meet different young people and see them perform in the Say's, Say's weekend workshops or read some of their writing in Say's weekend creative writing workshops or see them perform at the gala or meet them at camp. After sort of starting out with this very, very wide net, once I had started to hear young people's stories, hear their perspective on stuttering and on all that they wanted to accomplish, we just started going like this. You know, We just started bringing the focus of the film in much smaller and tighter. So. You know, the film focuses on five young people of very diverse backgrounds, very diverse socioeconomically, very diverse, uh, you know, m young men, young women um, from all over the country, all over the United States, all over the country. Um, so as we started to sort of limit the pool from, you know, 50 to and 60 young people that I'm meeting and interacting with and interviewing, the sort of five main characters kind of came into focus because they all represented very, very different journeys. There are a lot of similarities in the journeys, a lot of similarities in their challenges, but you know, Malcolm's journey at being a, a nine-year-old African-American boy from New Orleans um, who lost his father to, to violence um, and who didn't have sort of a role model or a mentor or someone to guide them through the challenges of being a kid who stutter is very different than Sarah's journey being from the suburbs in Chicago with um, two parents to, to really mentor and protect her and guide her through this challenge, a, a young Caucasian woman who's a little bit older and came to say a little bit later, you know, the journeys are just all very different. And that was very important to me. It was very important that, that no matter what you look like, no matter who you are, no matter where you're from, if you turn on the film, there's a good chance you can see yourself in one or more of the characters. And so that's kind of how the, you know, it would have been more cost effective and it probably would have been quicker if I had just locked into two or three young people from the very beginning and that was my the only people I followed. 
but it felt more important to me to really dive in, to say, and to these journeys with, with both feet, just fully dive in and then start to shrink down the vision for the film after getting to know people a little better. You know, um, you know, I, I, you know, like I, I'm, oh, I'm, you know, I'm, oh, I'm amazed, Ryan, how, how, you know, like, you, you know, you, you know, you had mentioned this before. There's very a little, you know, there's very little attention given or paid to stuttering, very little. And uh, you see, uh, you see, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, like I took, you know, I've, you know, like I've always had, you know, I've always had a severe speech impediment and stuttering. And uh, but but uh, but uh, you know like uh, you know I I went through speech therapy through the Toronto uh, Toronto Speech and Stuttering Institute in Toronto, and uh, you know compared to when I initially started my uh, my therapy to now I mean my 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 speech has really improved, but when you know when I retired and moved to to Newfoundland, you know so I started to to investigate what what supports are available in Newfoundland for Newfoundland Labrador for people to stutter. And Ryan, you know, I, you know, I, oh, I was, you know, I, I, you know, I, I was really amazed how little support there is or knowledge about stuttering in Newfoundland and Labrador. So, you know, like, you know, to to make a long story short, you know, I was very fortunate to to meet a number of like-minded, passionate, passionate volunteers, and we, you know, you know, we have established the Newfoundland Labrador Stuttering Association. Now we uh, the NLSA is only about two years old. We're going into our third year now, and uh, we in a, we have done a lot of great work in terms of raising awareness, understanding, acceptance of stuttering. But what what we're finding as well now that uh, it's great to wear, to raise awareness, but but we also need uh, data data as to how many people who stutter in Newfoundland. We we don't know that you see, and uh, so if 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 you know if 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 we're going to go to to advocate to to various levels of government for su supports, we actually need the data. And uh, so so the the next so we felt this is the next step. So 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 we so we you know we were very fortunate to to meet up with with, with Dr. Paul De Decker. Paul Paul you know Paul Paul is in the, is is an associate professor of linguistics in, in at at Memorial University in Newfoundland, and so so with you know with Paul's guidance we you know we 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 you know we we have established the what we call the uh, the, the the NLS NLSA uh, uh, so so literary collaborative project. Which, which which means that we you know you know we, you know we have a number of stakeholders involved from health education mental health and 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 so so we're, we're in, you know we have developed four surveys one for teachers parents who stutter speech language pathologists and um, uh, teach teachers speech language pathologists parents of people who stutter and and, and uh, uh, I'm missing one, Caitlin. What, what, what am I missing? <laughs> um, the only one I can think of is students, because that's me. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I can't. I'm sure there's probably other people that I can't think of right now either. <laughs> yeah. So, so I'm uh, sorry. Yeah. So, so there's there's four surveys which which we've developed: teachers, SLPs, uh, people who stutter, and parents of people who stutter. So, so we will be sending this out through the whole province, Ryan, just to get some data so at least we will know at least we'll have some evidence that yes the you know, these deficits exist but uh, we you know we you know we have a long road ahead of us and what you know what you, you know your group has done with, with, with uh, you know, creating the you know creating the beautiful you know my Beautiful stutter has really helped to, to you know, to raise awareness and uh, education about stuttering. So, the more that that uh, we you know we make this film you know uh, available to to people, it will also help us as well. Because as I was mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, there's very little little information or or uh, attention paid to stuttering. And uh, you see, you know, as 
as an adult who stutters, and and since Caitlin and I have started this podcast, we're really you know, we are learning so much about stuttering as well. It's it's really amazing. And I've I've been a stutter for most of my life, all my life really. And, and uh, I actually was a covert stutter for a number of years. And so so it's 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 it's, it's a terms of you know it's it's a whole process of accepting. When you know when you you know when you you know you were in interviewing the the, the 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 kids what was their reaction about did they talk about accepting that they stuttering the challenges associated you know what what you know what 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 was uh, some of their sharing like yeah i think i think in the film one of the things i try to to do is to highlight the ongoing constant conversation between parents of young people who stutter young people who stutter their slps their teachers and it, it runs this whole spectrum from, you know, some, some push for and believe that fluency on one hand is the only positive possible outcome. And on the other end of the spectrum is say, say is mission of convincing young people who stutter that the way they speak is beautiful. And if they never become 1% more fluent, they are still worthy of love, of friendship, of being heard. Um, and that, that's, a, that's a big, big spectrum. The young people that I met were much closer to Say's end of the spectrum where they wanted to embrace and embraced and, and thrived from the belief that the way they speak is beautiful and they deserve to be heard whether or not they ever become 1% more fluent. And the, the one person that I really highlight in the film that's on the other end of the spectrum is this dad, Mark. And the reason Mark is in the film, you know, is, is because he believes very, very passionately and his daughter therefore believes very passionately that fluency is the only possible victory for young people who stutter. Mark is not in the film to be a villain in that way. Mark is in the film because I want to show that even parents who are acting out of deep, deep, sincere love for their children can get it wrong by pushing for fluency as the only possible positive outcome or victory, right? Mark is not a bully. Mark is not mean-spirited. Mark gives his daughter all the time she needs to speak. Mark is a loving father who would run through a brick wall for his kids. But that belief that fluency is the only positive outcome is leading to a, a sense of failure for his daughter, for, for in the family. Um, and I think, you know, from my reporting in the film, from my sort of exploration of it, I think that can be really, really detrimental. And I think that's the, that's, that to me is a very accurate reflection of the constant conversation going on in households of young people who stutter. And you know, Caitlin, you're you're an SLP in training, a future SLP. One of the things, you know, I've done 225 of these screenings, you know, roughly half of those have been with SLP groups. So professional SLP organizations, NISLA, which here in the States at least is the grad school level uh, SLP organization for SLPs in training. And I get the question, I, I do these Q and A's afterwards and I always get the question, what, what sort of advice would you wanna leave us with? From these SLP groups. And I always come back to, I'm not a person who stutters and I'm not an SLP. I've been in this community. I've been witnessing it and experiencing it and listening for almost seven years. Here's what I've taken away that I would want to relay to SLPs. For many, many, many young people who stutter, from the minute you wake up in the morning, you put on your armor and you, you put on a thick, thick set of armor so that you are not hurt by, the, by your, your family who isn't listening or by the bus driver who isn't listening or by the friends on the bus who are teasing you or by the teacher at school who makes fun of you or by the peers who make fun of you or by the coach after school, right? The bus driver on the way home, the cashier at the restaurant. And then finally, when you get back at the end of the day and your bedroom door closes and it's just your space, you can take the armor off. And that is a journey that I heard represented to me over and over and over and over again, to the point where it feels like a universal thing for kids who stutter, a near universal thing. 
So the thing I come back to, you know, Greg, to your original question, the thing I come back to over and over again is as, as SLPs, as civilians who, who are not a part of the disfluency community, our, our biggest job is to be a person or a place where the armor can come down. And I don't personally see how striving for fluency can enable that armor to come down. I don't see it. I see the value of strategies and techniques and, and empowering, uh, especially young people who stutter to, to feel a little more fluent or to feel like they have something to lean on to, to give them a little more strength. But I worry that if the prism through which they are, are judging themselves becomes, am I fluent or am I more fluent? I worry that there's not a victory available there. So, so my, my thing that I always come back to with advice, and I think Greg, this goes to your initial question is, how do you make your interaction or your time or your space with young people who stutter, how do you make it a place where the armor can come down? And, and how do you define that? And it's more of a challenge and a question than it is an answer. But that's something that I always try to talk about in these Q and A's, especially when engaging with SLPs. Greg, I, I hope that answered your question. I hope that was you know close. Answer adjacent, I guess. Oh yes, uh, definitely. Uh, 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 oh, oh, I agree, Ryan, because I, I mean the uh, fluency. I've always considered the term fluency a bad word because it, because I think it adds more. I feel it adds more stress to to people who stutter because we're, we're you know we're trying to be like non i mean uh, uh, the, uh, the the uh, most of society who who are non stutterers that that creates a, a lot of stress and then unfortunately it actually sort of forces a lot of people who stutter uh, to go you know to, to go into the closet and trying to be uh, uh you know i mean they, they, they tend to hide their stuttering and uh, so, so they become uh, covert stutterers and unfortunately you see when you know when, as as you know as well right when someone tries to to hide their stuttering, uh, the, you know, one one you know lose you know lose, you know loses a, a sense of identity. You can't develop your own in, in, in individuality or, or identity if you're always hiding. But you see, this you know this this you know this also goes to 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 people who stutter who who do not hide, but it's always this temptation to avoid telephone calls, avoid social situations, things like that. So, so we, you know, we, uh, we have to get rid of the, 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 you know, the, you know, the, the, the attitude towards fluency. And I mean, the parents are, oh, I agree, Ryan. I mean, you know, parents, I mean, the uh, parents are, are, are very caring, lo loving and protective over their children. They think down the road as well, you know, what will my child be like out in the real world, you know? And uh, they, they, they also realize when the child comes home, depressed from school, and whatever, being bullied. It, it causes them a lot of stress, a lot of guilt, and and so, so this you know this you know this you know this is where we need films like 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 my beautiful stutter, the king's speech a speech to 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 you know to help support and, and you know and and help people to understand stuttering and then the effects of stuttering. There, uh, there there's no magic uh, pill for stuttering. There's no magic cure. And uh, the most important thing is to support people who started the parents as well that to, you know, to, to un, uh, uh, understand and, and to, to ed, educate the public. And uh, this, you know, this, you know, this, you know, this is a problem as well, because uh, as, it, uh, as we know, you know, uh, trying to, uh, you know, trying to educate the public uh, the public are, are listening, but are they are they they're hearing? But are they actually listening to to what studying is all about? And I think this is a challenge as well. Just you know, trying to encourage the public to take the time to really listen. Kayla, wonder if you have any thoughts? Yeah, no. I think what you just said. I think the best way to get the public to really listen is things like my beautiful set or like documentaries that are going to kind of grasp their attention they're not going to sit and read a research article or something like that it's, it's things like this that are going to kind of share the true experience of people who stutter for the public to see 
That's that's my hope. My hope really is. I, I know I gave this example earlier, but my hope really is that whether or not people engage with it right away doesn't matter. It's that when the conversation comes up, right? A, a family gets together for Easter and somebody's like, man, Biden, I heard Biden stutter in the speech the other day. Somebody has then a reference point. You got to see my beautiful. Have you seen the, the film that just came out about it? It'll explain, it'll explain a lot of what that journey is. You know, I, I really wanted people to have that reference point because it just doesn't exist and they need it. There has to be an easy, absorbable, entertaining reference point for people to, to latch onto when it comes up in conversation. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I did have a quick question. Uh, you have, obviously you mentioned it was like a very long journey of working on this film. Um, and uh, I was, I, you have, you've kind of had a lot of positive feedback. You've got a lot of support from kind of public figures and people like that. Are you shocked from any of the feedback that you've gotten or anything, any of the support you've gotten? What was that like to kind of see the growth, I guess? Yeah, you know, when, when you set out, when you're an independent, very independent filmmaker, when you set out to do something like this, you know from the very beginning, like if you're gonna do it, there's a good chance that you're on your own. You know, when you don't have a studio behind you, when nobody's paying for it in advance. Um, and so any support from outside of my circle or outside of the stuttering community is extraordinary. And it, it, it lifts up the film tremendously. So when I think Paul Rudd was the first, you know, big name to become involved, that, that put the film on a, on a different level because all of a sudden, People are like, oh, this is a real movie. This is a real film. You know, like that matters. That really, really matters. And then when Mariska Hargitay and Peter Herman joined, and then there's the, the baseball player, George Springer, who just recently became a, a Canadian baseball star. He was, he was down here in the States for most of his career. Um, as, as those people joined, more and more people were willing to take the film seriously. And it shouldn't matter, but it really does matter to get the film into festivals, to have organizations book screenings of it um, to get it distributed. Um, I think the, the biggest, most pleasant surprise has been in the US, Discovery Channel has picked up the film so that it can play on their new streaming app, Discovery Plus. And another reason that, that matters, it's very similar to a celebrity coming on board to support the film, just like Helen Mirren supporting it. Like when Discovery supports it, all of a sudden that signals to, to Discovery's audience that this is on par with some of the other science programming that, that you watch and enjoy on Discovery. And that really matters. People go to Discovery to be intellectually stimulated. They go there as for a reference point for great, great content about the world and about science. And so it's kind of a perfect home for this film. It's just another big name vouching for it. And it's always a pleasant surprise. It always means a tremendous amount. Um, but I, I will say from the beginning, the goal was to reach celebrities, to reach discovery, to reach big names, to help propel the film out into the world. Because that's just a reality. Of, you know, every year the media landscape gets more crowded. So you need to you need something to help you make noise. You need someone to help you make noise. Ryan, you know, what were the the reactions of the the kids after the the film was over? Were you know were they uh, like uh, happy? Did uh, did they share things with you afterwards? Yeah, yeah. I think the I think they're all very happy with how it turned out that it is you know a, a real film and not sort of just like a, you know videos are easy to make, but this is an actual movie. You know, is kind of the vibe that I've I've gotten from everybody, but. The, the feedback that has meant the most is Juliana has said a couple of times, um, I feel heard, you know, by the film, I feel like you really heard me. And that matters a tremendous amount. I, I took very seriously and continue to take very seriously how vulnerable these young people are just by being in the film. You know, it, it takes tremendous courage, not just to speak as someone who stutters, but to speak on camera. And then to just trust that this guy that you met like a month ago is going to turn it into something cool, you know, like that, that's an extraordinary amount of trust to put in me. And the other thing that I thought about quite a bit is these are young people. And so they are operating on, they're, they're young people with a lot of agency. They're young people that are, 
are smart and tough, but they're still young people. And they're operating on the advice of their parents and of tarot about this is probably a safe project to participate in. You know, and, and I wanted to honor that. I wanted the parents at the end of the process to be like, I'm glad I trusted you. I, I, you know, it was, it's always, as a parent myself, it would be a little scary to put my child's story in someone else's hands. And so I, there was just a tremendous amount of responsibility um, that I've tried to honor from day one. And, and, you know, hearing from Juliana, for instance, I, I do feel heard by this film is really awesome. Ryan, will there, there, you know, there be a, a sort of a sequel to to my beautiful stutter? Will it be like a follow up of some sort? You know, the easy the easy short answer is if somebody else pays for it this time, if somebody else puts up the money, because it's you know making a film is is real money and real time. Um, I think if if the stories present themselves as you know if there's another chapter that presents itself. Um, it's a definite maybe. Um, and I know, I think I'm, so I'm going to turn the film into a companion book that people can buy or download, probably a podcast series. And I think once that's done, the, the ecosystem around the film is done. You know, if there's a book, podcast, film, anybody can absorb this in, in whatever their favorite media is. But I think by the time I've done that, I'm done. Because probably by that time, it will have been about eight years spent on the project. Um, and I'll be ready to move on. And, and I'll hope that I've, I've delivered enough that people in the community can take the material out and, and actually like use it to, to further their, their agency and, and advocate for themselves. You know, would, uh, would you like to sh share a little bit with, with our audience, Brian, about what, what exactly is Cam say in uh, Hendersonville? What, you, you know, what is Camp Say? Yeah, so Say, the organization, um, started out in New York City exclusively and working with local young people exclusively. But the more Tarot describes in the film, you know, the more he would talk about his mission to create a place where young people who stutter can stutter openly and, and be heard. People around the country would say, how can I get my child into that experience? And so Tarot talks about wanting to build at first a small camp, but then over time, a much bigger camp for young people from all over the country to come and participate in say programs. And so uh, I think they built the camp maybe starting 10 years ago, maybe 12 years ago. And, you know, from having 30 kids the first year to now having a two week camp with 200 kids and then regional camps all over the country, you know, it's, it's grown exponentially because so many parents and young people still to this day, young people believe that they are the only person in the world who stutters. You know, they're sixth, sixth graders, fifth graders, eighth graders, fourth grade, you know, they can go through their entire school and social journey without meeting another kid who stutters. And so the, the camps have kind of exploded into a, a nationwide kind of thing. Um, and I think they're going to continue to grow. And actually, Say does a very good job talking about the camps and promoting the camps and making them accessible even to young people and families that, that maybe couldn't afford traditionally a, a two-week sleepover camp. So um, for, for sort of detailed information, I would visit say.org and reach out to them because they are very, very responsive. Um, they, they have seen an influx in requests for information about the camp since the film has come out. And so I think they are expecting to hear from people if, if there are additional questions. You know, it, 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 it's obvious, Ryan, that this, you know, this whole, whole, you know, this whole journey has really sort of left, you know, left, you know, left an emotional impact on you, this whole journey for about seven years. Do, do you want to share, you know, share a little bit about how it has, has impacted you as a non-person who stutters? Yeah, so I, I, I mentioned earlier um, the start of the 2014 Say Gala where a little eight-year-old boy came out on stage and said, welcome to the Say Gala. And, and he, he alone was sort of the biggest sort of thunderclap moment, like instigation for me to, to start making the film. And through the process of making it, I realized one of the reasons that struck me so profoundly is 
when I was eight years old and nine, eight, eight to 11, basically, I was teased and bullied for being fat. And that's not a politically correct word. I use it very purposefully here because that's the word that was used to make me feel less than, to make me feel unworthy of love, unworthy of friendship, unworthy of enjoying school, unworthy of enjoying the things that every eight-year-old should be able to enjoy. And I realized similar to young people who stutter, when I went to a guidance counselor in school and said that this was, this was really, really upsetting me and hurting me, I'll never forget the guidance counselor said, have you tried eating more fruits and vegetables? And the message I took that day that stayed with me for a very, very, very long time is that the bullies were right, that I was broken and the bullies were right. And I realized like, in, in a way, that's exactly what we do with young people who stutter when we try to, when or if we try to focus on fluency with them. Instead of, instead of saying, as a society from minute one with a young person with any disfluency, instead of saying, I know it feels tough right now, but the way you speak is beautiful and the world around you is broken and we're gonna to work together to fix the world around you. You just keep being you. Instead of saying that, right, we're not giving them that message, at least not enough, not clearly enough, not loudly enough, not in an organized enough fashion, right? We're doing the other thing. We're doing the thing way too often where we say, yeah, I'm sorry, the bullies are right. Let's see if we can get you fluent so you stop getting, so, you, so you're no longer made fun of. And I know there are tons of shades of nuances to that. I know that. But nuance is really hard when you're eight years old and your heart is broken and you are humiliated and you don't believe, you don't know that there's a bigger world out there. You don't know how to find the nuance. You only know you're being bullied for the way you talk and the adults around you are saying, we got to fix the way you talk so you stop getting bullied. So my, my emotional journey making the film, I, I feel like I was making the film for me at eight years old, for any kid with a disfluency at eight years old, for any kid who's different, being made fun of for being different in any way at eight years old. Because I think structurally as a society, we, ve we too often reinforce what the bullies are doing by trying to fix a kid instead of trying to fix the world around the kid. Um, I hope that answered your question, but that that's the core of my emotional journey making the film. And, and part of the reason that I've been fighting to make the film, get it out, get it seen, is I do want to change the world around young people who stutter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you're right, Ryan, because I mean, the, you know, the, you know, the, you know, the, we, we all know that stuttering has, has an impact on one's life, uh, all, you know, all, all throughout life, personally, professionally, career-wise, and everything. But you know, the, the you know the the earlier that we, we you know we can uh, support and connect with with the younger population that stutters, the you know we're really sort of you know preventing them or, or you know trying to, to to help them to to really sort of you know uh, to 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 to. to to not go, you know, not to experience the the baggage which a lot of the the older people stutter. It means so, so the more that, that that you know that we touch base with the younger population, and uh, which you know, which you know which is a challenge because we really all you know we also need need supports available as well. And uh, before we leave, you know, oh, I would like to inform our, our, our listeners that we that, that uh, we you know we will be sh uh, showing the b b beautiful stutter at you know during the week of in 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 in, in, in International Awareness Day, which which is around you know which is uh, uh, October twenty second, and we you know we you know we will be uh, in, you know doing uh, doing a virtual. Uh, 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 viewing of of up the film uh, uh, during that week, and uh, we, you know we will have Ryan uh, be the uh, facilitator of of the the film to to introduce it. So we we haven't chosen a specific date, but 
we'll we you know we will uh, let you know let our listeners know. And thank you very much for for, for, you know, for agreeing to this, Ryan. Thank you. So, Ryan, do, do you have 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 any lasting thoughts for our listeners? Any any. Uh, no, just thank you for listening. Thank you for having me. It's really an honor. Really, I made the I made the film for you all for folks who are who wanted to talk more about this and want to help you know improve the lives of young people who stutter. So it's just a real pleasure and an honor. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you as well. Now before we go, I'm, uh, Caitlin, do, do you have anything else for Ryan? Uh, nothing else questions? that I can think of. I mean, just the the typical thank you for what you did. I mean, I'm not a person who stutters, so I I didn't, I guess, benefit from the movie in that way, seeing people like me. But as a speech pathologist, or an aspiring speech pathologist, a hopefully a soon speech pathology student, um, I, um, I, I really feel like I get, I gained so much from hearing the personal experiences of people who stutter. That's what I'm doing here on this podcast. I am learning so much and that's what I did when watching your film is learning from their personal experiences, which is the most valuable thing a speech pathologist can do. Well, thank you again, Ryan, for all your your work and 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 and, and uh, you know and and I'm glad that you hung in there for eight uh, seven eight years. You know that you know that that was quite the the journey, but you know who you really have uh, have created an, an, an amazing film and uh, has has really sort of created a, a, a lot of awareness and also left you know le, you know uh, left a lot of the, I mean the public to, uh, uh, a, a lot to think about as well so but we we need more films like like you know like my beautiful stutter so so thanks again Ryan thank you very much thank you thank you for having me some Stutter La, Newfoundland and Labrador's first podcast about stuttering has so much to talk about. Let's start listening. This has been an episode of Some Stutter La, Newfoundland and Labrador's first podcast about stuttering. Some Stutter La is hosted and produced by Greg O'Grady, Caitlin Mayo, Dr. Paul DeDecker, and Luca Dinu. Some Stutter La is available on Anchor, Spotify, Breaker, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. To ask a question, send us a comment or suggestion, or just get in touch, find us online at Some Stutter Podcast on Instagram or at Some Stutter Law Pod on Facebook. Thanks for listening. <laughs>